I was born in Huntington, West Virginia, and uh, moved out to the country when I was probably five years old. Grew up on the Ohio River there, and uh, at that point, uh, my parents got divorced. I moved to Kentucky at that point, lived way out in the middle of nowhere. Grew up like playing in the woods and doing all that G.I. Joe type stuff, and uh, that was, that's kind of what got me interested in the military. Um, doing that stuff and watched a lot of war films and things like that and uh, I knew military was always what I kind of wanted to do so I like guns I like shoot guns all the time I remember one of the first times I shot a gun my dad let me shoot a 12 gauge when I was about six and it poof, shot came up and popped my nose and from then I was kind of hooked on that um, I always had a gun with me when I was in the woods and stuff uh, um, went to church, a church going family, every Sunday, Wednesday night, we were at church. Uh, that was definitely a major part of my life. Um, as far as school, they, I was kind of expected to graduate, but that was about it. Um, weren't, weren't a whole lot of, uh, of uh, repercussions, I guess you could say, if I got bad grades. So. Military was kind of something I I seen was my only way to pay for college uh, through through high school and stuff. And I had a decent GPA. I, I didn't even really look into uh, scholarships and stuff. I just I was using that as an excuse to go to the military. So it's kind of just something I always want to do. I used to when we lived on the river in West Virginia, 19th uh, Special Forces Group would fly over in uh, helicopters and parachute into the fields by the house and I watched those guys and thought that's something I want to do and uh, that's what I pursued was um, parachute infantry and um, I, uh, I joined September 7th of 2001 just before September 11th I was still in high school at the time so the late entry program and that was kind of a shock whenever that happened and I remember people yelling, we're going to war and stuff in the hallways and stuff. And I'm like, you're, you're probably not going anywhere, but I know where I'm going. It, it made me more determined, I think, as far as school. My GPA went up and, and set it down, you know. I was, I was definitely set on getting out of school, but I wanted to uh, finish strong and, and make sure I graduated so I could go and serve. And that was... That's really what I wanted to do was go to war. That's why I joined. Um, whenever I was growing up, I remember Desert Storm watching that in elementary school. They'd have it on the news. I watched that and thought I wanted to. I wanted to do that one day. It's kind of a weird thought, but I guess as as boys, I guess you would understand that you just you want to go to war and prove yourself. I guess. Well, I wanted to join the Air Force initially. Uh, I wanted to be a combat controller and had uh, pretty bad eyesight. And I said, well, what's the next best thing? And they're like, well, uh, Airborne Ranger, that's the next best thing. So I was like, that's what I want to do. Um, so I signed, uh, signed up with a Ranger indoctrination program contract or whatever they call it. And I was supposed to go to Ranger school and all that. And I got to Airborne school and I'm like, uh, don't want to do that. So they sent me to the 82nd, and um, that's how I ended up there. Okay, 82nd, 82nd Airborne. 82nd Airborne Division, yes. Okay. When we went to the, the reception battalion, um, which is where we went when we first got to base, and that's where they figured Fort out where we were Georgia. going, uh, Fort, Fort Benning, Georgia, okay. um, home of the infantry. Uh, and they sent us... And they chose where we're going to go. They marched us up the road, and I was getting all nervous about it. Took us out to this big field, and they dumped all our bags. And uh, they said, you have something something like two minutes to find all your, this 150 guys, find both your bags, and get back in formation. Of course, that wasn't going to happen. Are you still in civilian clothes at this point, or are you already? No, you, we were in uniform. Okay. Uh, they had issued a uniform, and... And now we're just looking for our gear. And uh, of course, we didn't find, you know, we didn't separate it. We were all working as individuals. They were using that as a uh, learning point. And uh, so we were all down pushing, uh, doing push ups at that point. And a drill sergeant walked over to me and he seen I was, you know, I was struggling. And he looked at me right in the eye and he said, 
you're looking weak, Bowen. And when he said my name, it, I mean, it's, just, it's like, man, this is real. That's when it became real to me. He's, he's seeing me. I'm not sitting in front of a TV anymore watching this. This is, this is for real. So that was the initial, initial uh, thought whenever I ran into a drill sergeant. Most memorable moment. Um, probably Sunday is getting to go to church. Uh, going to church and that was a day to write letters and stuff. Mm -hmm. and you would have thought I was locked away for, you know, 10, 20 years the way I wrote letters. And writing letters every chance I got. And have, you, have you gone back and read any of them? <laughs> I have, and uh, it's pretty, pretty ridiculous. Some of them, right. just uh, exact, you know, exaggerating how tough it was, and trying to get sympathy and, and all that. It's pretty funny. Eleven Bravo Infantry, um, basically front lines troops. Um, really, what our focus was on whenever I went through most of my training was urban warfare, kicking in doors, finding. Finding specific people, targets, if you will, um, doing uh, things called battle drills out in the woods, uh, specific uh, missions. Maybe uh, there's a machine gun nest. You have to go and knock that out, um, capture you know whoever, um, enter and clear trenches. Um, as far as the the airborne side of it, uh, seizing airfields. Um, which would involve uh, a mass uh, parachute drop into an airfield or a, a mock airfield and then applying all these infantry skills that you learned in basic training and that you've trained up to, uh, to a different scenario such as an airport and uh, how you would take that, on, you know, take that down, uh, capture all the buildings, the insurgents or the enemy um, and then allow for follow on, on forces to come in through that airfield with with the aircraft or, or whatever it may be. Yeah, the, the one thing that really stands out is um, the officers. The officers always led the way out of the airplane. And uh, I seen an officer standing in the door, a female officer, and uh, I'd never worked with females in, in the military because I was relatively new. So one of the first experiences with females, I seen a female getting ready to jump out of the airplane and she does this number, you know, and I'm like, wow, she thinks this is pretty dangerous. And she's an officer. She's probably a little braver than I am, but she, she's obviously scared. So that's, I mean, I got nervous. Um, and it's just, you think you're sitting, standing there with a static line hooked up to the, to the cable, which is what pulls your chute out. And you start, you see that green light come on. That's a scary feeling to me. I get nervous about it, but um, then you start moving towards that door. You see everyone else jumping. You're thinking, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap, oh crap. And then just turn and go. You just don't even think about it. And it's a very scary feeling uh, to come out of an airplane. But once your chute opens, it's just like a sigh of relief. It's, it's a good feeling from that point on. But it didn't get any better for me, though. It's just scarier and scarier every, every time. time. Yeah. <laughs> Fort Bragg, North Carolina. It's very, very nervous about going there. Um, Probably more so than going to basic training, actually, because I knew that that was the unit that I was most likely going to go to war with, and uh, I wanted to make a good impression on those people. Um, so I went to a reception battalion, which is, of course, where we went before they, they chose what unit we went to, and uh, that was kind of a, a bad time. Uh, everyone hates that because it's just a, a time of uncertainty. You don't know where you're going. You hear about all these other these units that are leaving, going to Iraq or Afghanistan, or well, it was just Afghanistan at that time. Um, so, you, in a way, you want to get into those units that are going, but in another way, you don't. So it's a lot of a lot of mixed feelings there. What's the time frame that you arrived there? Let's see. Um, my initial orders were actually to the 18th Airborne Corps, um, and I was there for about a month, and then they changed it to 82nd. So I was in reception from December, like mid-December of 2002 to probably late January of 2003. Okay. I kind of had this plan in my mind what I would do, how I would tell people that I was going, as far as my family, how I was going. Um, had all that lined up and, and that 
I think the rumors and the uh, likelihood that I was going to go to war was, was a big, big help with that. It helped me to uh, to put that into perspective and see the reality of uh, of the fact that I will go. So, all the first sergeants from all these battalions came out, and they talked to us all. In, or, well, it was really sergeant majors from these battalions came out and they talked to us individually. Um, they were kind of the, the the big wigs, the bosses, so as far as you know, all the men go, and they wanted to choose specifically who they wanted in their battalions. And, it's kind of uh, a recruiting, scouting trip, isn't it? Yeah, and you know, I was I was a um, kind of a, a small kid with about the size I am now. I'm about 145, and I had big glasses and didn't look like your ideal infantryman or paratrooper. So. Um, it's just like gym class, you're the last one picked or whatever, and I went to the 1st Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, which had a, uh, has a very uh, very respectable history all the way back to uh, the World War II, and um, it's definitely a unit that I was proud to be in from that point once I learned the history, and that's one of the first things they told us was the history when we went to the battalion, and they told us to learn it. So that was a proud moment for me. At the same time, I was pretty anxious about it, though, because mm -hmm. I knew that the, at that time those guys were, when I went there, they were, they had been home for about a week from Afghanistan. So you got a lot of combat vets, and then you have me, a little 145-pound kid with glasses, standing there with the eyes, you know, big as basketballs, thinking, "Oh my gosh, what am I, what am I doing here?" And uh, how old are you at this point? Um, at that point, I believe I am 18 still. Yeah, I'm 18 at the time. There's a lot of other 18 and 19 year olds that were just coming back from combat in the unit you, you went to? Um, I think the youngest one was probably 19, but yeah, they're, I mean, pretty darn close. And uh, to me though, they were, they were like 35, 40 year olds, so even though they were just as young as I am and or just about and their experience put them way up here to me and uh, I I don't know I had a great deal of respect for them and uh, and they knew that and I think they use that against me sometimes but uh, but yeah I mean I guess that you get old quick and war so At first, well, my platoon sergeant came upstairs and he said, everyone in the hallway. And this was a time when we lived in, in barracks, so all the, the lower enlisted lived in the same hallway, just like dorms at school and um, at our college. And you, you live where you work. He, he said, everyone in the hallway. So we, the whole platoon was out in the hallway. And he said, all right, um, this is kind of your unofficial notice. Um, within 45 days, we'll be leaving. I say 45, but expect about three weeks, and um, that was, it was kind of a shock, but at the same time, you didn't want to show that, you didn't want that to be obvious, and especially with all these other war vets there, and there's only like five or six of us who were new, and so we played it off as, all right, we're going to war, you know, we're, we're going to get our combat patches, and our badges, and all, you know, met ribbons and medals, and we were trying to be all heroic and manly about it, but in reality, it was, it was scary, and uh, I uh, didn't know how to call and tell my parents, you know, or tell my mom. My mom was who I was worried about. My dad, I knew, would be proud. But um, so after after work, everyone was released. You know, they left. I went in my room and I just kind of sit there like, this is this is it. I'm going to war, and uh, now how am I going to tell anybody? And that was kind of the experience with finding out. Never received word on what the specific mission would be, but as far as specific um, country, I found that out um, pretty pretty quickly. Iraq. Um, they didn't know. They didn't even know where, which province or area we were going to until we were in country. Um, so I knew where what country we were going to, but that's about it. And that was. Found that out pretty much a couple of days after they told us we were probably going. So I remember that that Sunday. It was a three-day weekend. Um, packed my stuff up, went down and got my truck, and 
uh, of course, my mom cried and hugged me for about you know three hours and and uh, saw me off. But that was that was about it. Um, as far as family, they called me. You know, my brother called me as I was going to uh, to Pope Air Force Base, which is where we flew out of. He was he called me on the phone to say one last goodbye, and that's where I, I turned my phone off and I threw it in my truck and went and got on the bus and left. So. And then we hit the hit the ground and I watched I watched that movie Platoon a lot when I was a kid and when they first landed in Vietnam they lowered the the back gate of the airplane and you see the the uh, heat wave across the runway and you see palm trees and stuff and I flew over there in a C5 which is a double decker plane I walked downstairs and uh, came off the back ramp of that they lowered the the gate and I look out and um, I, I seen one palm tree like way off in the distance because there's not very much vegetation there and I just see heat wave all the way across and dust and I'm like wow it, it just felt like I was walking right into that movie. Then they load us onto a bus and uh, took us to what they call the tent city and uh, that was at the Baghdad International Airport. They took us to this tent city and they had probably 100 guys shoved in every tent. You know, the, the cots, it was like you were almost sharing cots with people to sleep on and no room at all. And that was where we waited for two weeks, uh, maybe three weeks for our, our orders, where we were going. We done, uh, I think we'd done like one, one mission out of or done a couple air assaults out of um, Baghdad for the first couple weeks and then we just kind of sat, sat around and waited and uh, didn't know where we were going. So At first we were supposed to, I thought we were going to stay in Baghdad or somewhere around there because I thought that was a dangerous spot, you know. They're, that's where they're going to send us big bad paratroopers, you know. And uh, uh, my team leader came in and said, we're going to the Wild West. And I'm like, well, what does that mean? And he said, well, that's what they call the city we're going to. And he said, uh, City's called Al Fallujah, and uh, like Al Fallujah, I never heard of that, and and I tried to say it a couple times, and finally got the pronunciation right, and uh, they said it's a pretty dangerous spot, right in the center of the Sunni Triangle, and uh, that's where a lot of insurgents were, and uh, we'd be heading there. I think we had two days uh, left in Baghdad, and we'd be driving there, and um, it was kind of kind of scary thought. Uh, I think he was building us up and or getting us prepared mentally, uh, telling us, you know, giving us some, some some stories. I don't know as far as how reliable they were or what of what's happened there since the war kicked off and what's currently happening there, what type of insurgencies we're looking at. And um, so we, I, I'm not going to lie, I was scared to death at that point. I thought this is where I want to die is how Fallujah, or however you said it, you know, that's where I'm going to die. And, uh, yeah, it was a nerve-wracking time. Honestly, I don't really remember any cultural training, and I think that that might be because we, had, we hadn't been in Iraq long enough for them to, to uh, really implement that training. In Iraq, and uh, as most people know that have been there, Iraq and Afghanistan, totally different cultures. There's a lot of similarities, but there's a lot of differences too. And um, so they didn't really have training implemented at the time. If they did, um, I don't recall. And if they did, it was oriented more towards like the uh, Afghani population. So. The first uh, mission was, uh, I was scared. Um, as everybody, we went over to the airfield there at, uh, in Baghdad before the sun came up. Um, waited on the helicopters to come. Helicopters landed. Um, there was, let's see, it was our company, which is broke down into four platoons. Um, headquarters platoon, which is like a mortar section, which launches rockets and or uh, explosives, things. Like that. That's what they deal with. Um, uh, line line platoons, which is your your infantry platoons, which go in and, and either secure the objective or go into it. And uh, we had different platoons in different helicopters. So we had Black Hawk helicopters that picked up one platoon, and we were in Chinook helicopters, which are the double prop helicopters, kind of big. 
Uh, you can fit quite a few people on them. The platoon that left in the Black Hawk helicopters went up and secured all four corners of this compound we were going into. And they dropped them off. And when they were explaining this in the, um, they were doing, you know, giving us the plan of how the mission is going to go. They were explaining this and, and everything that was rolling through my head was, you know, the movie Black Hawk Down. You know, this is, this is exactly what they were doing and look how it turned out, you know. And this is probably how it's going to end up with them. Um, my team leader was was building us up, saying if we take fire, which we probably will, you know, and uh, this is what we need to do, and this is experiences that I have and what you can learn from. So we were loading the helicopter, and I was a nervous wreck, and they um, they put um, Fox News was embedded with us. First mission, Fox News was on there. Uh, Mike Tobin was was on the airplane right across, sitting right across from me, and uh, we were flying, and I thought for sure as soon as that helicopter hits the ground, there were going to be bullets flying everywhere, and I was locked and loaded and ready to, ready to run out and fire back and possibly even die. And um, I was scared. Um, helicopter landed us. They landed uh, about 200 meters away from where we were supposed to be. We got off of it, and uh, my heart just pounded. Uh, before, I even, before I even started running, uh, my heart's just, just going uh, and um, get off the plane and helicopter or the helicopter and it took off and it was just complete silence. It was like, wow, the calmness after the storm or something. And, and I was looking around like, where, where's the enemy at? Where, they're supposed to be shooting at us and um, throwing, ro you know, throwing grenades and shooting rockets at us and, and all this stuff, I, you know, and they're nowhere to be found. And uh, we went and we finally figured out they dropped us off in the wrong place. We seen where we were supposed to go. The other platoons were sitting over there waiting on us, had the area secure. They're like, you know, what the heck? Uh, why'd they got, you know, why'd they land you way over there? And so we had to run through these trench lines and creeks and stuff and, and get over to where they were. And then we went into this, this house and uh, it was the first time I'd entered a, a house in a, in a combat situation and really it was by that point even though I ran across the field because we weren't getting shot at or anything it was a little I was a little more relaxed by that point seeing that it wasn't as intense as I thought it was going to be and um, we we began entering these rooms so we, I mean, we uh, kicked the door in and went in and start going door to door and clearing the rooms and everybody I mean there was no resistance at all there's people in the house uh, you we arrested them, cuffed them, uh, took them outside, um, had them questioned and, and whatever, and searched the house. Um, as far as the the room searching techniques go, that kind of shocked me because uh, they were just like, search everything. Um, if you have to make a mess, make a mess. And at that time, uh, I think even the leadership was trying to get a feel for things. Um, so we learned from that. You don't want to you don't want to totally trash people. I mean, we didn't trash it, but we we dumped a lot of stuff out and left a mess, and that's not very good uh, in publicity. And uh, I learned from that and seen a lot of things in that house that was a cultural shock to me as far as uh, um, artifacts, and uh, they didn't really have much at all besides they had a lot of Saddam Hussein propaganda hanging everywhere, a lot of a lot of paperwork and booklets and stuff, and that's what I mainly went through and searched, but. Um, it was kind of a shock. There was no, no beds um, like you'd see here. There's just like mats on the floor, and I'm like, what in the world, you know? How these people live? Um, and then we, we finally started Exfil. Uh, found out, you know, this guy, yeah, he's con he was connected to the Bath Party at one time. We, we took him with us. It was probably his first helicopter ride too, and uh, went and called called for the helicopters. They came back, pop smoke. Um, let them land. We loaded up, took off, and went went back to Baghdad. And that was my first mission, complete mission. Scared to death when I went, um, thinking no sweat when I was leaving. I mean, I could do this every day. Not a shot fired. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Not one shot. And uh, there were even people, Iraqis, stopping on the side of the road, just watching us, like, like it was an entertainment to them. Like, what in the world are you people doing? You know. Over time, we, we received some luxuries. In the first several months, we didn't have anything. I mean, you had a nice place to stay. You slept on cots. 
but you didn't have power, you didn't have uh, cold drinks, you didn't have air conditioner, TV, or refrigerators, or any of that stuff. But, but I'll tell you, uh, about three or four months into it, though, we had all that stuff, and it was it just kept rolling. And people, once people started receiving the care packages from their families, and churches, and stuff, I mean, we were getting TVs and. Um, PlayStations or whatever the game systems were at the time, I don't remember. And um, people had laptops that people were sending them, and we even uh, had air conditioners sent to the unit. Had air conditioners brought in, so we had air conditioners, uh, generators, power converters. I mean, we were besides the fact that we were cramped, and we were working in a kind of a dangerous city. We were living it up. In, in Iraq and for infantrymen that was like I don't know that was like a five-star hotel it was great the first time I ever directly came into contact was uh, pretty scary um, I can't even remember when it was um, I remember like a, a span of time it was, it, it was between October and January I don't remember exactly when it was but we were on a mission, and I don't remember a lot of the specifics of the mission, but we were meeting up with a um, a, a more special unit, I guess you could say, uh, for lack of better terms, than what we were. Um, we met up with them north of Fallujah at an overpass, and they had uh, these big, they were relatively new at the time. They were, uh, I think they were called strikers. Um, there were these six-wheeled vehicles with big guns on top, and they were armored, and uh, you had guys hanging all over them. They had these real cool guns and stuff, and they were a mix of Ranger Battalion and uh, Special Forces soldiers. We met up with them at this, uh, this overpass, and we went through the north side of the city, which was a, a part of the city that we didn't go into very often. It was, so it was kind of uneasy to go through that area. And um, went through the north side of the city. We hit. Our job was pretty simple that time. Uh, it, we weren't going into the buildings. All we had to do was secure the secure the perimeter. So get out, make sure everything stay is safe, and and stay safe on the outside while we, you know, the special forces guys, ranger guys, go in, take care of the mission, um, do whatever they had to do. They didn't, I didn't know what their mission was. I don't think any of us did. Uh, they went in, done what they had to, and then come out and we leave. We had two missions at night. We hit one, pack up, go to the next building, hit that one, we were done. And um, we got to the first, rolled into the first place, and uh, we were in what they call Little Detroit, um, which is a pretty dangerous part of town, but it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, we had, you know, the, they said the Army owns the night um, because... We had night vision, lasers, all that stuff. So we, we seen what was going on, even though you know who you know anyone else wouldn't have um, if they didn't have that type of technology. We jumped off the vehicles. Uh, we had specific areas we were supposed to secure. Mine was pretty simple: jump off the vehicle, go 15 feet that way. There's a uh, a little makeshift car dealership there with a bunch of BMWs and Mercedes sitting in the front. Overwatch that building and then there's buildings over top of it that you need to watch rooftops. The rifleman on my team, I wasn't a team leader at the time, I was a uh, grenadier. Which is? Um, I'm sorry, uh, um, grenadier is somebody who has, you have your basic carbine or your rifle and on that you have a, um, a grenade launcher that's attached to it and uh, you uh, you stick a grenade in it, and pull the pull the uh, the barrel back, and you pull the trigger, and it pops a grenade. I mean, you can shoot the grenades much further than what you could throw them. So, so that's what my specialty was, or my job, my specific job was to shoot grenades. Um, but anyway, um, rifleman was off to my left side. He was watching down this road, and uh, he had a rooftop over top of him that he couldn't cover. So I was kind of watching it for him. The automatic rifleman, which is the machine gunner, um, which is where all our firepower was, was to my right side. And then on his side, his right side was our team leader, and um, we were we secured this whole area on our own. And um, 
I keep scanning over, you know, looking over to make sure everything's good with my buddy there. Um, you know, you're working buddy teams, checking on him. I look up to the rooftop, and as soon as I look up at it, I hear the distinct sound of it, an AK-47 chambering around. AK-47 is the, the weapon of choice for most of your enemy uh, soldiers. And he, this guy, I turned, and he had an AK-47, a big guy too, and it was coming down like he was coming down to, to draw a beat. It was almost like he seen my buddy, but I don't think he did because he was kind of behind a pillar, and um, but he was coming down to shoot in that general direction, and I thought, oh, crap. And I had my weapon up, and, and it was pointing in that general direction anyway, so all I had to do was turn my laser on, line it up with him, and, and start pulling the trigger, and... And uh, that's that's what I've done. Um, I put the laser on him, uh, put it right here in his chest, and uh, I would, by that time I was very nervous, I guess you could say. I was shaking, and I put that laser on his chest, but it was probably all over the place, and I just started pulling that trigger, and I probably, I probably put... 10 rounds downrange with just that one person and uh, they obviously hit him I don't I don't think they hit exactly where I wanted to because I was I was kind of flustered at the time and um, then somebody else ran out the back door by that time my buddy uh, Shannon still was his name he spun around and raised his rifle up and, and shot the guy who was running out and uh, I shot that guy twice as well he fell down behind a wall and um, then about that time, I and mean, this is just like all within just a couple seconds. And I look back, and this guy that I initially shot is still standing there. He just like just rocking back and forth, and I'm like he he's not dead yet. And so I um, I think it was my team leader uh, shot him again, and uh, he he went down at that point and uh, hit the ground, and it was almost like. Uh, Kind of like in the movies when things just go in slow motion, and you it's like you hear everything um, just kind of quietens down except for that one specific thing. And the one thing I remember hearing, even with all the gunfire going on, was uh, was him hitting the ground and just like smack, and his leg curled up behind him. And that was that's something that I will never forget. Um, was him hitting the ground? Yeah, that was it. Was very weird to talk about your first because that was all of our first combat i mean even the guys who had been to afghanistan a lot of them hadn't been had hadn't seen combat right. and uh so it was really weird to talk about and um especially weird that my fire team was responsible for for killing at least two and um then there was another couple guys that got shot somehow and or they were shot anyway and uh they uh, they came around eventually came around and, and turned themselves in so that they could get, receive medical attention because they were wounded pretty bad and uh, so they turned themselves over to us and we of course gave them aid and done whatever we had to do with them and then um, uh, I think what it really hit home a couple weeks later uh, or maybe a week later one of my other friends was on gate guard and uh, out front you know searching vehicles as they were coming in and out. And, and um, he said that they brought the bodies, the bodies of the two that we killed, they brought them to, to the base. And um, come find out one of them was a boy, like a, it was a father and son, and one of them was pretty young. Um, I'm not sure, I think they said he was 14 or something. Coming from somebody who at that time was, uh, at that time I was 19, a 14 year old boy was, was still way too young to die. Uh, well, shoot, anybody was, I don't know, just, I don't know what to say about that. It was just, that was something that was hard to swallow. Um, and I think the guy who told me was bothered by it because he had kids and stuff. And I don't think he meant for it to have the effect that it did on me, but that it really bothered me. And uh, But from there on, I mean, um, after talking, you know, you're talking with my buddies and, you know, I think it it uh, kind of went to the back of my head and you had several other missions you had to yeah. focus on, so. 
I get nervous about it. Um, um, to be honest with you, uh, I don't usually, unless you ask me about it, I, I don't usually tell you about it unless you've been there and, and had some sort of experience with it. If you're a veteran, I feel pretty comfortable about talking to people that are veterans. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as far as anyone else, um, like a lot of people, including my wife, will say, uh, well, you don't, you don't talk about it and, and stuff like that. And I, I have to try to understand their viewpoint on it, but uh, my viewpoint on it is you never ask. I'm not going to tell you. Um, right. So it's very uncomfortable to talk about to just any, any old person, civilian or whatever. A lot easier to talk to somebody who's been there and done that. No one will, no one will ever understand your experience, your individual experience. My experience with that, even that one situation, is going to be different than even the other guys on my team. I'll never understand how they felt, and they'll never understand how I feel, and that's a very difficult thing to swallow. Is people will never understand, no matter how you try to convey that. Um, and that's once you, once you understand that, I think that helps with the whole process. So. From what I understood from locals and stuff, they thought we were a pretty uh, violent unit. Um, maybe we, maybe they thought we had the idea that they had in Vietnam a body count or something like that, like we were just out to kill people and that's it, which wasn't the case. We were there to help them, but um, there's a lot of bad situations and, and uh, of course with the bad publicity that um, kind of ran over into locals and they developed their opinions but on top of that, um, I believe it was also a, a buildup of insurgencies from other countries like Syria, um, Bulgaria, and Germany even had people in that area working. Um, I'm not sure who they were working for, what their, their objective was, but there, there was a buildup there. When I came home, it was a great feeling. Um, never felt like that in my life. It was, as far as changes, um, I don't know, I just, I valued things a lot more um, because you, even though we did have quite a few luxuries, there's still a lot of things I missed out on and uh, valued things quite, I mean, the uh, uh, actual real Pepsi that's not from some foreign country is, is a precious, you know, a Pepsi, you know, I wanted to go to actually American made food, you know, even if it's, it's fast food or whatever. Um, Whenever uh, you're driving down the road, it's a little different. It, that was probably the time whenever I realized that, um, wow, this is uh, this is a little weird. I'm driving my truck down the road, and I want to drive in the middle of the highway because you know here, you know, three weeks ago I was in driving out of Fallujah, and there's IEDs on the side of the road, and now I'm driving, and I'm safe, and that was just that was something else. I, the way that my views changed is a totally different respect for being an American and the values uh, that my values changed uh, as far as uh, I'm just grateful f to to be here to live in this country um, because I've seen how it could be and um, I realize the sacrifices that a lot of people paid like, um, over history for us to be here and so things I took for granted, I don't, I don't really take for granted anymore. I had maybe 15 months left on my contract and I was out of the Army. So I thought, well, if I can get to that one-year mark, they won't send me, and which was in uh, July uh, four years? of uh, 2004. Okay. So July 2005 was when I got out of active duty. Did they start doing all these, uh, these training events and stuff that I, I kind of thought this is a little weird. Maybe they're just trying to implement this new training to get people used to Iraq, Afghanistan, but they start implementing uh, this training using us and we're just constantly going out and training and doing these, uh, these uh, missions. We're doing uh, urban training, uh, taking down cities and joint training with other forces, other, other types of units and um, it just seemed like it, it was a build up or something. We were all kind of kind of skeptic of something going on. Um, we had to have our bags packed. We were, we were on 
like a 30 minute recall, so we couldn't even leave town. Uh, we had to stay within the, the area. Uh, Did so, you were really given any clarification on why that was? No, we weren't really, they didn't really tell us why. And uh, we went through uh, uh, ORS, which is a uh, weapons readiness pretty much. They make sure that all your weapons and equipment's ready to go to war. And uh, we went through that, and the very day we went through it, um, they checked us off, they said we were good to go. And I got a call on my cell phone. Um, I was driving downtown for some reason by one of the uh, the armors, and he said, hey, did you hear? And I said, what's that? He said, we're going to Afghanistan. I said, are you serious? And this is in September. So I have less than a year left in the Army at that point. And uh, he said, yeah, we're, we're leaving on Saturday. And this was a Thursday. And uh, it's like, oh, that's uh, that's cool, I guess. We went to a place called uh, Zermatt, and uh, that was between Gardez and a town, I think you pronounce it Coast. Uh, so anyone who's familiar with that would maybe know where I'm talking about, but pretty much we were in this valley and my team leader was trying to explain it to me at the time. He's like, pretty much that right there is Afghanistan, that mountain range, that right there, that mountain range is Pakistan and you're in between. And uh, he pointed out some spots on the mountains in that little town that we were in saying that that's where um, Al-Qaeda and the Taliban have been infiltrating Afghanistan from Pakistan and bringing in weapons and supplies and stuff and that's why we're here. We're here to find those people and um, we were there for two months. Um, totally different, totally different culture, um, totally different than Iraq. In a lot of ways it's like Iraq was pretty prehistoric in my opinion but I mean this went way beyond what Iraq was. It was, I mean, these people, they had absolutely nothing but what was on their back in a, in a mud hut that's been there since, you know, before Jesus walked, you know, the earth. And uh, it was kind of amazing just, just watching those people and what they can exist with or what they can exist without, really. I mean, they can just, they're happy, and, or for the most part, a lot of them are just happy and just living their life, and they have nothing. And uh, that was it was a culture shock to me, even after being in Iraq. There, there was definitely a, a big change in equipment. When we first got to Iraq, for instance, we had cargo Humvees, which were like any old truck on the road, pretty much, no armor or anything. We had to pile sandbags up on, in, on the seats and uh, floorboards, places like that, to, to help protect us from, uh, from incoming rounds, explosions, things like that. Um, they didn't. They didn't do a great job because if you're sitting on a bench, you only had about that much, um, that much protection in front of you. Underneath, in the floorboards, in the back of the truck where you're riding, there really wasn't any protection because it would have weighed the truck down quite a bit, and that might have caused some issues. But um, overall, we initially didn't have much protection at all uh, in our vehicles. Um, Equipment-wise, we had. Um, of course, the bulletproof vest and the uh, the helmets and goggles and all that personal protective gear. And we had, I mean, we had the best weapons out there uh, that were to offer. But um, when we went to Afghanistan, though, well, actually, let me say, uh, before we went to Afghanistan, uh, they did start armoring our vehicles. They bought what they call Armox, and it was like really good armor, supposedly. And they started armoring our trucks with that. So. We looked like the Beverly Hillbillies going down the road, but we were protected though. And uh, it, I mean, it was all rusted up and all nasty looking, but we were, I felt safe. And um, then we went to Afghanistan and they had brand new armored Humvees waiting for us when we got there. And that was, that was a change. Um, so they definitely, uh, they definitely equipped us quite well in Afghanistan. I'm trying to find a college to go to. That's That was my primary goal right then. I didn't want to re-enlist or anything. I just want to get out and go to school. And um, so I started applying to colleges. I applied to probably, probably 20 different colleges and got acceptance letters from a lot of them, got denial letters from the rest of them. And, uh, and uh, I was going to go to college in uh, North Carolina, which was 
in the mountains and stuff. I was going to do that, but it's, you know something changed my mind with that, and I came back to Kentucky. Uh, and went to Morehead State University, which is a small school, and I didn't want to go to a big school like like UK was what I consider to be a big school, and I just kind of want to be tucked away in the mountains somewhere where I felt kind of secluded, you know, um, where I could focus on my schoolwork and didn't have uh, didn't have to deal with the fast-paced lifestyle of the city or anything like that. And I went in, I started, uh, I wanted to be a medical doctor at the time, and uh, of course found out that biology doesn't agree with me, and uh, changed my major, and eventually ended up in psychology. And uh, I think uh, a big part of that major change kind of, and I think, let's see, I started off as a biology major, and I had a lot of trouble with that, and I think it, a lot of that had to do with the transition process, like coming out of the military and it was rough um, going to school and sitting in classrooms with kids that are fresh out of high school at the same level you are educationally, but as far as life experience and stuff, you felt like you were far ahead of them. And um, I didn't get along with hardly anybody. Uh, I tried to get along with people and try to make friends and stuff, but I, I had trouble making friends because I just couldn't connect to them. Sure. The only people I could connect to were people who were in the military prior or currently. and. Um, I think that hurt my grades a lot, but um, then I switched my major to psychology, so that might have been it too. Uh, I switched my major to psychology, my grades went up quite a bit, and that, that summer in between that, that uh, major change, um, I had met my wife. At that time we were just dating, and I got to know her, and I think she helped me a lot, come through uh, a lot of transition stuff, and helped me to, to kind of figure myself out and uh, figure out how I'm going to do this whole school thing and make it work. And so I started doing a whole lot better after that. I think I, I don't see as much respect um, from classmates, or I didn't see that much respect from classmates because to me or to them, what they were seeing was this kid that looks like he's just out of high school, even though he says he's been to war and stuff, you know, and, you know we don't know whether he has or not. And uh, I don't think they really respected me anymore. There may have been a few that did, but. Um, I don't think that I earned any more respect, and a lot of them were were kind of naive to what I what I done, and you know the army. They, when they think of the army, they think of JROTC, junior, you know, reserve officer training corps in high school, which is like Boy Scouts. That's what they think of when they think of military. So they kind of put you into this stereotype or whatever, like, oh yeah, you you, you played army once. That's cool, but welcome to school, you know. I'm kind of looking right now as, as, as to probably getting out of the military um, within the next two years or so. Um, I'll have 10 years in at that point, and uh, I just feel like I've done enough and want to want to go on with my life outside of the military. Um, when I look back on that, I, I kind of wonder why in the world did I go that route? Uh, why did I, when everyone else went to college and stuff, and and done that, you know, went on with their their life as far as that goes. Why did I join the military? Why did I want to go to war and put all that stuff on hold and just kind of set my life back for several years just to 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 go fight a war for for those people, you know? And I think back on it, why why did I do that? And I'm a Christian. I I have Christian beliefs, and I think God put me there because that's where I was meant to be. Um, I made a difference in somebody's life in, in that time I was in the military. Surely, um, maybe I saved somebody's life. Maybe they, maybe they saved mine. I don't know, um, and that made a difference to them somehow. But um, looking back on it, I don't regret it at all um, because I feel like that's where I was supposed to be. I feel like that was what God's will was for me, was to take every step that I took in, in you know, Fallujah or or whatever, see the things that I've I seen so I can come back here and use that to make a difference in my, uh, in my life here. And that's really what shaped me and uh, kind of guided me into the, the field that I'm going into as well with uh, social work. So I don't regret it at all.